And uh, we will now move to question time. And it's time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. And we'll start with listed questions. And I call Mrs. Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one, please. Uh, Kolyer, uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McKeon to answer this question. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions one and ten together. The Executive's draft 10-year strategy for affordable integrated childcare is out for consultation until mid-November. The draft strategy fulfils a programme for government commitment and puts child development at the heart of the Executive's vision for childcare. A central aim of the draft strategy is to give all of our children the best start in life preparing them for lifelong well-being and achievement, thereby creating the basis for a better, more prosperous future. The draft strategy sets out the Executive's vision for childcare based on shared aims and objectives and proposes 22 areas of development where action is needed to give effect to this vision and proposes the creation of a significant number of new childcare places to meet need. We recognise that this will lead to an increased demand for skilled childcare workers and we fully expect the current workforce to expand. Workforce development is a key element of the draft strategy, <clears throat> pardon me, building on the key first actions launched in 2013. There are a number of specific proposals for training to enhance skills and create pathways into working in childcare. And we are working closely with the Department for Employment and Learning on the detail of estimating the extent of demand for new training places and the cost of meeting that demand, and with the childcare partnerships also. We are currently undertaking a skills audit in each of their respective areas. Delivering the child care strategy and achieving its aims and objectives will require coordinated action from across a range of government departments and services. Thank you. And I call Ms Judith Cochran for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the, the Minister um, for her answer. Given that children born at the start of this mandate um, would have started school last week, does the Minister think that it's acceptable that the parents of those children will have been disadvantaged for four years and will continue to be disadvantaged going forward due to the failure of OFMDFM to deliver real tangible action on affordable childcare, even when there was money allocated for it? Well, the member will be aware that the money that has been allocated, I assume you're talking about the Bright Start, the, the 15 actions, um, the, the money is allocated. There's been several million already spent in those child care programmes. Um, indeed, I mean, I've been involved myself in a number of um, uh, service providers who came and got money for um, different elements of that Bright Start and those first actions. And I think that because that was school age childcare that we were concentrating on, because that's where the need was identified in the beginning, I think that, that, you know, that, that that's getting rolled out. Um, but this, this will actually complement the childcare strategy, as I said. This is a 10 year strategy. There is uh, monies and resources put to this strategy, and that will be um, hopefully rolled out in the same way that those first actions were also. So I think, I mean, obviously, um, we would hope to do more always in childcare. You could never have enough childcare, but we would hope that this would provide a, a quality service, an affordable service, which is, is very important for people, particularly people in families on low income, but certainly to make those childcare places available. Thank you. And I call Mrs. Rosaline McCorley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Um, can I ask the Minister uh, how will disadvantaged children be catered for in any child care strategy? Well, as I said, I mean, it's important that disadvantaged children um, are included within that strategy as well and disadvantaged families. I think a central aim, as I said in my, my response to the, the, the first question, was that it's to give all our children a best start in life. And early care and education initiatives, including child care, should first and foremost be focused on the developmental uh, needs of the child. Investment in the strategy must also address the needs of disadvantaged children to ensure better life chances for them and help break the cycle of, of intergenerational poverty that we have. And it cannot simply be about service in the labour market. And I think that this is what this particular strategy looks at. It's about the developmental um, uh, program, programs that are there to develop the child as well and the needs of that child. Um, we also know that investment in the early years leads to greater economic, social and emotional benefits later on in life at both an individual as well as a societal level and can counter the effects of that disadvantage and deprivation. 
This includes children in both workless households as well as working households, and we need to make childcare more affordable. That there is essential because actually 70% of our children who are in child poverty now are living in families where at least one of the parents is working. So I think that, that it's very, very clear that we need to ensure that uh, those low-income families um, are, 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 are sort of provided for as well. And just last week, um, we had again child poverty figures published by DSD's Households um, Below Average Income Report. And again, there has been three points of a rise in uh, relative child poverty. And we cannot separate child poverty from poverty and families. That's, uh, that's very, very clear. They can't be separated. They have to be seen in a holistic way. And I call on Mrs. Sandra Overland. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Mr. Speaker. Um, why has OFMDFM, I'd like to ask the OFMDFM, why have they failed to spend the £12 million that was set aside in the programme for government uh, for accessible, affordable uh, childcare? And can I ask uh, the Minister what is their assessment of the number of people stuck on benefits who would rather be in work but cannot be because of this OFMDFM failure? First question, or your last question first. I don't think it's a failure of OFMDFM. I think that we're going to see from the Westminster government, indeed, um, just not about welfare reform or welfare cuts. We're also going to see when the tax credits hits families, that's actually going to put people out of work, and, and that more people, people will actually be out of work because of the, 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 the decrease in their tax credits that's going to become um, uh, very much uh, to the fore. But just in terms of funding, I mean, to answer your first question, to answer your first question about funding, I mean, between 2011 and 2015, there was a budget for £12 million to be ring fenced in support of the um, child care strategy, and £4.7 million has already been allocated, and to date, there is £3.4 um, million has been spent. Um, so I think that, that really there has been money spent. Okay, there hasn't been all of the money spent, um, but at the same time, this is all going to be part of a strategy. And can I also remind people, because it's very, very important, this is an executive child care strategy, so all departments have responsibility for this strategy. Well, Mr. Stephen Agnew. Mr. Speaker, and while I welcome the long-awaited publication of the consultation on the child care strategy, um, to some extent that it the strategy will only be good as the resources that follow it. Uh, could I ask the junior minister what work has been done to cost the proposals in the child care strategy, and are those uh, costs likely to be met? The, the development of the strategy was a co-design process, as a member would know, and we have, we have been um, out talking directly to stakeholder organisations who provide childcare, but more importantly, we've been talking to parents who actually need that childcare. So all that has been costed within those proposals. Obviously, as the individual actions are, are rolled out and, and delivered, we would have to look at an economic um, case for that, but certainly there has already been costs and the resources that are needed um, will be um, very easily identifiable within that. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, Ken Collier, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, uh, Junior Minister McKeon will answer this question. Um, the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry was initiated by the 2009 Assembly debate about historical institutional abuse of children. Its terms of reference refer to children under 18 years, and it was on that basis that the inquiry was designed and its chairperson and panel members appointed. We are sensitive to the views of those who have suffered abuse who fall outside the scope of the current inquiry and are mindful of the equally destructive impact it has had on many people. To consider amending the scope of its terms of reference at this stage Pardon me, would undermine the work that has already gone into reaching this critical juncture of the inquiry. Officials have completed a scoping exercise in relation to mother and baby homes, Magdalen laundries, and clerical abuse, which we are presently given careful consideration to. And I call Mr. Alban McGuinness for supplementary. Yes, uh, could I thank the, uh, the Minister for her reply? But it really doesn't meet uh, the full gravity of the situation where you've got uh, a discrete number of cases outside the terms of reference. And it really is not sufficient uh, for the Office of First and Deputy First Minister to simply say it's outside the terms, therefore uh, we can't do anything. 
There has to be something done, and I would urge uh, the First and Deputy First Minister's office to go back and look at this and see, even at this late stage, uh, that there can be de something decisively done in order to remedy uh, this uh, anomalous situation. And the member makes a very valid point, and I think that, that we have been, um, in terms of the op options paper, that I know um, DFM have already uh, made their views very, very clear on the options that they would like to see, the options in and around the mother and baby homes and the Magdalene um, type laundries. We do believe there should be a separate inquiry into that. It's very essential, particularly for the women who were over 18 as well that um, were in those uh, institutions, and also about wider clerical abuse, that there's also um, that we feel that it should be an inquiry into that. And even in terms of options about redress, we have already had a number of meetings with uh, the, the churches and the, the different religious organisations in terms of that, and more importantly, with the people who were directly impacted. So all those issues are being um, discussed. And as I say, we've had discussions with uh, the, the uh, FM side on this. So we will be looking to pursue that and, and to progress that um, and to see where that um, uh, actually goes to. Mr. Stephen Mutry. Speaker, given that last week the murder of Brian Taggart was described as, and I quote, the most horrific case of child abuse being considered by the HIA inquiry to date, and given that the junior minister has just said that she's sensitive to those who have suffered abuse, what junior minister would your comments be to the family of Brian McTaggart, given that you were also a member of the IRA in the past? Well, can I just say to the member, um, it was, um, I have spoken to the family of, of uh, that young fella, and I think that, that really, you know, um, we have to say that, that uh, uh, killing, you know, um, but I'm talking about historical institutional abuse here. Um, can I just say that, that um, you know, any child, no matter um, what institution they were in, um, that suffered this abuse, it's horrendous. And also that, that you know a death of any child, no matter what the circumstances are, is very tragic. Order, order, and I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. But uh, can I ask the minister what work has been done in terms of the redress issue for victims and survivors of institutional abuse? Well, as I said, my other um, answer, basically, in terms of the, the redress, we have had a number of meetings uh, over a, a long period with um, different individuals and with the four main churches and religious orders. We've also had meetings with Professor Kathleen Daly, who came from uh, Australia, to talk particularly around redress. Um, to, to try and sort of develop a model, um, a redress model. So that is all work that's ongoing. And certainly, you know, um, obviously we can't preempt what's going to come out of the, the inquiry and the recommendations that, that the inquiry will make. But at the same time, we're hopeful that a parallel process where work is getting done will be done alongside that whenever um, the recommendations are made. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alec Maskey. Uh, question number three. Uh, question number three. Uh, the functions transferring from our department to the new Department for Communities were agreed by the Executive and outlined by the First Minister in a statement to the Assembly on the 2nd of March this year. Uh, the new department will assume a range of OFM-DFM functions in relation to the Social Investment Fund, Racial Equality, United Communities and Good Relations, Disability and Poverty, Gender and Sexual Orientation, and Northwest Sites and Strategy, but also assume sponsorship responsibilities for the Community Relations Council and ILEX, which are currently arm's length bodies of OFM DFM. I call Mr. Maskey for supplementary. Cormac, I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for that response. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister, could he give us a sense of the other, other functions which have been transferred to other departments on the departmental restructuring? Well, uh, in addition to the, the functions which are, are transferring to the new Department for Communities, uh, we are transferring functions across many of the other uh, future departments. For example, policy responsibility for childcare strategy and for children and young people will transfer to the Department of Education. The Department of Finance will take over the functions of the Government Advertising Unit and the NI Direct Central Editorial Team. 
The Department for Infrastructure will take over responsibility for the Crumlin Road uh, Jail and some former military sites. The Planning and Waters uh, Appeals Commissions will transfer from OFMDFM to the Department of Justice. And uh, that's on the basis that we believe these are the aims which will ensure better and more joined up government. And I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, the functions uh, amongst which he, he, uh, Deputy First Minister raised were the uniting communities function. What contribution does the Deputy Fir First Minister believe uniting the communities would deliver if he were to admit to all of the extent of activity that he engaged in in the past when he was a provisional IRA second in command in Londonderry? I don't think that question is relevant to the question before us. Okay. <clears throat> Call Mike Nesbitt. Mike Gibson. <laughs> Mike Gibson. <laughs> Same school, wrong person. Uh, would the, uh, the Deputy First Minister is no doubt aware that the policy on coastal management and erosion is a scribbled note uh, from a civil servant called Bateman in the 1960s, uh, and, and that effectively it says it is not an issue. But it is an issue when roads outside Ballywater collapse uh, because of coastal uh, mismanagement that impacts on an everyday basis on the people of the Irish Peninsula. So will the Deputy First Minister commit to looking at this and the restructuring of functions and promise the people that there will be a lead department for matters with regard to coastal management? Uh, we are certainly willing to give that uh, consideration. Yeah. Thank you. And I call Mr. Adrian Cochran Wilson. Watson. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Programme for Government 2011-15 set a challenging agenda for the executive. Since its publication, despite difficult economic conditions, our record in delivery has been strong. Overall, 81% of Programme for Government commitments have been achieved, improving on the 70% achieved in the last programme for government. OFMDFM led on 14 of the commitments, finding innovative new approaches to tackling deep-seated cross-cutting issues. Through delivering social change, notable successes have been achieved in supporting numeracy and literacy, as well as providing more help for families and young people. We have committed $55.4 million to the social investment fund projects. 67% of the total fund. Over 80 million of competitive funds has been drawn down from Europe, demonstrating our increase in success in engaging with Europe. Seven major good relation programs have been put in place under Together Building a United Community, and this is the largest investment in constructive community relations in our history. When we published this program for government, we made sure that we set the bar high for departments in terms of delivery. It was meant to be ambitious and to aim at transformative change. The achievements of the executive in this period show the benefits of this approach. Mr. Cochrane Watson, for a supplement. Does the Deputy First Minister not agree that the failure to deliver in the programme for government, failures such as the Mayor's Long Cash site as a generation site, Failures such as the £80 million not spent in the Social Investment Fund. Failures such as to deliver the construction of the Policing Fire Prison College. Are they not indicative of the failures that this executive is dysfunctional and fail failure to deliver the people of Northern Ireland? Well, first, uh, can I welcome the member uh, from South Antrim as a a new boy to uh, these institutions, and I think the, the, the question actually shows how new he is, <laughs> because uh, the member will be aware that uh, as part of the attempt to implement the project of Maze Long Cash and the creation of thousands of new jobs and uh, the development of one of the most prime sites in uh, Western Europe. This was opposed by your party, uh, but not just the Ulster Unionist Party. It was opposed by others. Uh, I think it was a big mistake, but I think 
you know, the track record of the Ulster Unionist Party over the course of the last uh, four or five years is there for everybody to see. I know that uh, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party tries in the media to portray himself as, a, as someone who is up for agreement and forging agreements and criticising uh, the DUP and Sinn Féin, when in fact the uh, Ulster Unionist Party uh, were to the forefront of opposing the development of the Maze Long Care site. Uh, the Ulster Unionist Party are also to the forefront of opposing uh, the moving of the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development from Belfast to west of the Ban. It uh, sends a very negative message to people west of the Ban about where they're coming from in relation to the whole issue of equality. And of course, also opposed the uh, determined determinations made by the Parade Commission and uh, found themselves uh, lined up alongside loyalist paramilitaries in uh, uh, a unionist loyalist uh, pact which was formed some time ago. So I, I won't take any lessons from the Ulster Unionist Party about forging agreements. I think in the course of the uh, delivery of the programme for government, being able to deliver 81 per cent is some achievement. Can I ask the manager specifically to maybe provide a, a, an update on the programme for government commitment in relation to the one plan for Derry? Well, the, the one plan, as many people know, is embedded as the keystone of regeneration in the city of Derry. Uh, a number of the buildings in Ebrington are, uh, are shortly to be completed, and a, a future phase of market testing is also planned for four buildings. ILEX is tasked with the development and regeneration of the Ebrington site, helping to make it one of the key shared spaces within the city. $16.5 has been spent on capital works uh, on Ebrington to date. A further $2.8 has been made available to ILEX for 2015-16. And there has been significant uh, development on the Ebrington site, which will increase confidence in the city and help bring businesses to Ebrington. The recent success of the Northwest Regional Science Park and Capital Developments at Everington, which will come on stream in 2015-16, will provide opportunities for job creation in Derry and the North West. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Deputy First Minister mentioned the uh, key programme for government commitment around building a united community. Um, one of the, the key uh, commitments in the Building a United Community strategy is to tackle all forms of uh, all manifestations of paramilitarism in our society. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister what more he thinks the Office of First and Deputy First Minister can do to ensure that that is achieved? Well, I, I think that there, as always, is a duty and a responsibility on all of the political parties and every single politician in this assembly to be seen to stand together against all forms of paramilitarism, armed groups, or those who are involved in criminal activity. And uh, I think my track record in the uh, course of the last uh, eight years as Deputy First Minister is second to no other member in this House, to such an extent where I have been uh, very upfront in my condemnation of those who would resort to violence of any kind. My life has been threatened as a result of it. It hasn't put me off. I will continue to oppose those who would attempt to drag us back to the past. And I don't care what labels they uh, put on themselves or others put on them. It is the duty of everyone in this assembly to stand against criminality and violence. And I have stood with unionist ministers. I have stood with the chief constable of the PSNI. Sadly, when it comes to confronting the activities of extreme loyalists who are attacking and injuring police officers on the street. I have yet to have any unionist leader stand with me. I am not going to issue any further warning. What will happen if people continue to barrack from a set of great position is that they will not be called to participate in the remainder of this plenary session. Mr. Speaker, question number five. Uh, I can't call you with your permission. I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. 
On 1 July 2015, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Ian Duncan Smith, announced that he will bring forward legislation to amend the Child Poverty Act 2010. Mr Smith and the Secretary of State for Education, Nicky Morgan, have written to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister following this announcement to outline the potential proposed amendments. On 9 July, the Westminster Government announced a welfare reform and work bill to Parliament, which aims to put this new proposed approach into law. The bill includes clauses to remove the duty on the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to meet the four current statutory targets and to enact a new approach to tackling child poverty for England. The Government has indicated that each devolved administration can decide whether or not to propose amendments to the provisions in relation to their duties and statutory obligations. In line with Scotland and Wales, we have agreed the proposals of the Department for Work and Pensions. We are currently considering the potential impact on the positive work carried out to date locally to address the circumstances which cause more of our children here in the North to face poverty and the impact of poverty on their lives. The executive's approach to child poverty won't be determined by the bill currently before Parliament. I call Mr. Agney for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the junior minister for her answer. Um, one of the proposals coming forward from uh, the Secretary of State, Ian Duncan Smith, is to move away from the measure of poverty as 60% of the average income. There has been plenty of documented evidence of how inequality um, impinges upon the prosperity of, of uh, the poorest in society. Could I ask the junior minister to give a commitment that Northern Ireland will not move away from this important measure of inequality and poverty? Yeah, I mean, as I said in some of my earlier man or, uh, answers to the questions, I think that the poverty, you cannot, um, first of all, you can't divorce child poverty from poverty within families. And I think it's very, very important that when we are looking at measures of poverty, we look at income um, and low income, but we also look at deprivation as well. And I think that, that all those measurements, um, um, in my opinion anyway, those measurements are probably the two most important when looking at, at child poverty. And I think that, that we do, there's other measurements there about educational underachievement and health inequalities and everything else. But I do think that when we're looking at child poverty, that we need to look at income that comes into families, and particularly uh, uh, deprivation within, within families and with the, uh, the deprivation of those children. And, I mean, it's very, very um, clear, you know, when, when a child hasn't got enough to eat um, because the family don't have enough money to feed it, and the child's living in a damp house, or a child's living in, in an in a, in a, inadequate housing, or they don't have, you know, for instance, a computer to do homeworks, they are all going to have that impact on those life chances of that child in later life. So I think it's very, very important that those measurements um, around in common deprivation are there. Thank you. And that comes to Sean Lynch. Yes, Programme for Government 2011-15 sets five priorities for achievement by the Executive. Each priority has a set of identified outcomes for achievement. In managing the implementation of the Programme for Government, our role is to support departments to deliver their commitments. It is also to ensure that delivery of the commitments delivers on the outcomes that we have identified. Uh, to take an example, Programme for Government Priority 2, creating opportunities, tackling disadvantage and improving health and well-being, identifies outcomes including fewer deprived communities, uh, reduced uh, health inequalities, uh, greater equality of opportunity and economic participation. One of the advantages of having a programme for government managed centrally from OFM DFM is that it enables uh, this strategic focus on uh, outcomes achievement. I call Mr Lynch for supplementary. I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Can he inform us if any work regarding the next programme of government for 2011-2021 is ongoing? Well, notwithstanding the current uh, political difficulties and acknowledging that a programme for government for the period 2016-21 will be a matter for an incoming executive following the next Assembly election, work is ongoing to look at potential high-level objectives and to identify possible delivery models and governance and uh, accountability structures. In particular, we are exploring the potential benefits of an even greater focus on outcomes through the developments of an outcomes framework for the uh, public sector. 
Uh, it is helpful that the development of the new structures in government and preparation for a new programme for government are progressing together. This should ensure that the future delivery of outcomes will benefit from better collaboration and decision-making across government departments, leading to uh, improved accountability. Thank you. And, uh, that brings us to the end of the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask uh, the ministers what representatives they've made, representation they've made to the Prime Minister and to European representatives regarding the Syrian refugee um, situation? Well, I uh, had the opportunity to speak to the British Prime Minister David Cameron uh, just a few days ago, and uh, obviously the, the conversation centred on the present difficulties that we're experiencing here at the Assembly and exploring how we, we can take that forward and obviously welcome the fact that uh, we are going to go on to what will be vital talks over the course of the next short while to try to resolve those difficulties. I took the opportunity during the course of that conversation to raise the plight of refugees and to uh, stress what I believe to be the case that in Scotland and in Wales and here uh, in the north that we are willing to play our part and do more but that he needs to do more. And of course, today he's making a statement in the House of Commons in relation to the numbers. Now, obviously that does represent a huge challenge for all of us. This is a, a, a horrendous situation uh, where people have been uh, displaced from their homes as a result of war and conflict in their own country. And of course, uh, you know, we, we look at the journeys that these people undertake. The, the, the way they risk their lives and the lives of their families to escape from war-torn situations. Uh, and I think we have to look at, at all of these people with incredible admiration for their willingness to walk something like 170 kilometres from one country to another to find safety. Uh, there's this argument around should they be called migrants or should they be called refugees. They are clearly refugees, but they're also people who are willing to take enormous risks to save their lives and the lives of their families. I, they don't strike me as people who are looking to end up in the north of Ireland or in Scotland or Wales or Germany. And, and I applaud the Germans for the way in which they welcomed the, uh, the refugees and the fact that they've offered to take something like 800,000 of them. They don't strike me as people who want to sit on their backsides when they get there. And I call Ms. Karen Kevitt for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Or, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, can I ask the Deputy uh, uh, Minister if a plan has been thought out as to what role Northern Ireland can play uh, to help the Syrian refugees, and what example will you, as a leader, uh, set for the people in our society regarding the Syrian refugee, refugee crisis? Well, I, I have to say, from the, the comments that have been made by all, all of the political parties who have spoken on this issue, it, it's obvious that all of us uh, want to do more. I want to do something, and I know that OFM DFM and officials within OF, OFM DFM, under the tutelage of the two junior ministers, have been involved in discussions over the course of recent times about how we can contribute to alleviating the plight of these people. Uh, that work is continuing. I, I would hope to have a conversation shortly with the first minister because I think that there is uh, that there is urgency required in terms of taking this forward. But work. Is already underway. Officials are involved in that work. Junior ministers are involved in that work, and I think that uh, there is no doubt whatsoever that the first minister and I wish to contribute to playing our part in alleviating the plight of these poor people. Thank you, and I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Will those 2011-15 programme for government targets not be met by the Northern Ireland Executive default to a 15-16 programme for government, or has the Executive just forgotten about government policy now until the election? No, I, I think that uh, when you consider that we have delivered 81 per cent against the backdrop of a 70 per cent return for the previous uh, pro programme for government, uh, that, that represents uh, a huge success for our executive. Uh, and I know that we, we deal on a consistent basis with commentators and uh, some news reporters, not all, who continually try to portray 
the executive uh, as a place where no decisions are taken. Well, the fact is, many decisions uh, have been taken. 81% uh, of the programme for government has been delivered. Uh, there is still outstanding uh, work to do uh, on the other 19%. And I think that as we go forward in terms of uh, future programme for governments, whether it be for the rest of this term or into the next term, uh, no doubt serious consideration will be given to how we can continue to up our performance. And I call Ms Sugden for a supplement. Um, I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. I still don't think it's good enough. So will he now um, provide me with the names of the civil servants to approach in order to get things done for the people I represent now that the government has proved itself finally defunct? Well, I, I wouldn't agree with uh, that analysis. Uh, it sounds like a wee bit of political point scoring and ignores, 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 the fact, ignores the fact that I was able to present to the Assembly today the, the reality that 81 per cent of the programme for government uh, has been uh, delivered, uh, and that against the backdrop of a previous 70 per cent return, that represents a considerable improvement. Uh, and I know that there are people, as we approach the election, and they're not all members of uh, individual political parties, who are also fighting their own election, and that includes uh, the member uh, for East Derry, or as she would call it, East London Derry. So I understand all of that. I'm very philosophical about it. The reality is that a lot, an awful lot of good work has been done, not least in terms of job creation and attracting foreign direct investment that has put thousands and thousands of people into new jobs. And Mr. Leslie Cree. Speaker, I would like to ask the First and Deputy First Minister if they still support the Stormont House Agreement. Yes. I call Mr. Cree for a supplementary. That being so, Mr. Speaker, I wonder uh, why they object to the Ulster Unionist Party going into opposition. Uh, I don't object to the Ulster Unionist Party going into the opposition. I don't, I, don't know where you, I don't know where the member got that notion from. If the Ulster Unionist Party or the SDLP or Sinn Féin or the DUP want to go into opposition, we have made provision in the Stormont House Agreement for that. But it's interesting that the question comes from a member of a party that uh, doesn't support the Stormont House Agreement. My understanding is that the Ulster Unionist Executive has never met to endorse the Stormont House Agreement. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I, I don't want you to take up that invitation. We'll uh, move on. And Mr. Patsy McGlone is not in his place. So I call Mr. Neil Somerville. <coughs> Question number one. You're listening for a topical question, Mr. Somerville. And present your question, please. Is the Minister aware of the serious concerns about the prospect of Inniskill and Courthouse closing and the impact this will have in the terms of accessing justice and leading to delays right across Fermanagh and South Tyrone? I, I applaud the member's ability to come up with a question. <laughs> and have you ever given the question in the course of the last uh, few minutes? But uh, the uh, Justice Minister is uh, following me uh, in, in questions. Uh, and no doubt he might have something to say in relation to an Gillen Courthouse. <laughs> and uh, Mr Somerville, would you be ready with a supplementary? <laughs> okay, I'm going to move along quickly, Mr Daphne Mackay. And this has already been referred to in terms of the situation uh, regarding to refugees, but could I ask the Deputy First Minister, would he welcome the statements from church leaders, uh, and in particular the Pope and the bishops, uh, and encouraging the public uh, to care for the refugees and indeed bring refugees into their own homes? Yeah, I have to say, I, I'm very encouraged by what I'm hearing from every section of society, not least the church leaders. I, I think that the terrible events of the last uh, couple of months has brought it home to everybody. Uh, e even though I think it's very sad that we have to see the, the dead body of a 
an infant lying on a beach in Turkey for it to be brought home to everybody within society. So there now is, uh, I think, a, a very uh, strong response within society to what is uh, an incredibly sad humanitarian uh, crisis. Now, uh, I want to welcome the change of position by the British government on this issue. And as I said earlier, I spoke to uh, David Cameron uh, last Thursday. And uh, we're obviously awaiting the announcement uh, by David Cameron on how many refugees will be assisted and what the British government intends to put in place. And we will certainly play our part in that. So it is a tragic situation, and OFM, DFM, as I say, has been discussing on how we might respond for some time. Months ago, our officials had already met with Belfast City Council, Derry and Strabane Council, uh, the Refugee and Asylum and North West Migrants Forum on this issue. And we will be looking very seriously at what needs to be put in place in the coming days. But I think it is heartwarming, the public reaction, and it's great to see that countries like Germany and, and others are prepared to play their part. We too have to play ours. Um, Mr Mackay for supplementary. Can I get it, uh, can I it? And I see as well that the Dublin government have announced that they will be taking, uh, aiming to take 5,000 uh, refugees uh, in, in the 26 counties. Uh, will the Deputy First Minister be uh, in contact with the Dublin government, with the Taoiseach, uh, to ensure that whatever can be done on a cross-border basis in regard to the refugee crisis will be done? This is something that transcends politics in terms of the human misery that uh, people are going through at the moment. And I certainly think uh, we will have discussions with uh, the Irish government about how, on the island of Ireland, we can all uh, contribute. You know, people are exercised by the numbers. Uh, and I, I done an interview in the course of the weekend where I, I talked about, uh, certainly from my perspective, uh, a willingness to take uh, 2,000 people. Uh, at that time, the talk in the South was that they would take 1,800. But this is all something that we have to agree among ourselves. And no doubt in my discussions with the First Minister, we will, uh, first of all, deal with this issue with considerable urgency. Uh, I don't think it will be any difficulty in coming to uh, an agreement. Uh, and we are prepared to work with you know, the British government, the Scottish government, the Welsh government, and the government in Dublin uh, in terms of how we can uh, help uh, these people through what has been uh, an horrendous ordeal. Thank you. And I call Mrs Judith Cochrane. Thank you. Um, does the uh, Deputy First Minister believe it was a mistake not to progress welfare reform as per the Stormont House Agreement, which he said he still supports, uh, with the uh, Northern Ireland concessions in place, rather than uh, risk um, the full Tory version now being imposed? Well, I think the member knows as, as well as I do that uh, the announcement that talks are to take place. It provides an opportunity for all of the parties to try to resolve the outstanding difficulties in relation to the Stormont House Agreement, but particularly around the issue of uh, welfare. Uh, I don't think it was helpful for uh, Theresa Villiers to say what she said uh, in the course of the weekend, because what she said effectively undermines devolution. And I note the fact that uh, there was uh, a critical comment made from the, uh, Charlie Flanagan, the uh, Foreign Minister, uh, in relation to those remarks. I think what we all need to do over the course of the next couple of weeks is knuckle down, uh, get the agreement, and uh, hopefully put the past of uh, argument around this issue and how we protect the most vulnerable, disadvantaged, disabled people within our society, whilst at the same time ensuring that we have the ability to deliver first-class public services. And Ms. Mrs. Cochran for its supplementary. Um, thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. I'm just wondering, has the Minister um, learnt any lessons from the climb down from the Greek government in July? Um, will he therefore be bringing some fresh thinking to the table? <laughs> well, I, I think my track record over the course of over 20 years in terms of bringing new thinking to the table and uh, resolving some of the most intractable problems that people thought would never be resolved, which all of those decisions have resulted in the members sitting in this House today. Yeah, we all have to. We all have to, as we face into talks over the course of the next couple of weeks, uh, recognise that there are huge challenges, and th that there is an entire community out there who support all of us in different ways, 
who, who expect strong leadership from all of us. But the difficulty is that the austerity agenda being imposed by the British government, whether it be in England, Scotland, Wales or here, uh, uh, provides an opportunity for us to do something different. Devolution is about making a difference, and that means making a difference from what they do in England, and that's what I am trying to achieve. Time is up. And, uh...